Hey Randy, did you hear about the Viking who was selling bad ion batteries? No. Yeah, they were no charge. Ow, come on, take it easy. I told you no more dad jokes. Greetings, fellow interloper. Welcome to Episode 3 of Space Camp for Noobs, an in-depth look at the basics of No Man's Sky for the brand new player, or the player who's been away from the game for a while. We have a lot to cover in this episode, so let's just get right into it. As I mentioned in the opening episode of this series, this is intended to serve as more of a guide than a playthrough. In my opinion, much of the fun of the early game is kind of immersing yourself in the storyline and that's not something I want to spoil for first-timers. So let's pick up where you follow the signal to your first space station so we can take a tour now that we have our pulse engine. We can hold down R1, L1 on PlayStation or RB, LB on Xbox to activate our pulse drive. If we line up our aiming radical where we want to go, autopilot kicks in and it'll pull us out when we near our destination. As you pull in, it's hard to miss that giant orb in the back of the station. At the time of this recording, no one quite knows what the function of this will be, but we're all waiting anxiously for the next update. What do you guys think? Is this thing using power, or is it producing power? Hmm. Let me know down in the comments. And I'd be also curious to know, what do you think this override code is all about? A cool feature of space stations is that they attract a variety of travelers, not only willing to buy and sell goods, but they're also willing to sell you their ship for the right price. So there's three main races that you'll come across. Viking, the warrior race. Corvax, tech-savvy humanoids. And Gex, who thrive on trading. There are five types of ships in No Man's Sky, and each one has a higher stat ceiling in a specialized area. Explorers are made for long distance travel and have an extended hyperdrive range. Haulers have a ton of storage space, but that comes with a hefty price tag. The more storage a ship has, the higher the cost. Since they're hauling a lot of potentially valuable stuff, they enjoy a buff to their shields. Fighters, as you might guess, are great for battles and do the most damage, but as you'll eventually learn, all ships can be upgraded to the point where space battles end in a matter of seconds. So while fighters are cool, any ship can eventually become dangerous. So yeah, find a ship that you like and you can work on upgrading it. Shuttles are pretty vanilla as far as strengths and weaknesses go. They're not especially great in any one area, but they're not bad in any area either. This is usually the first ship many buy because they provide a nice upgrade for storage at a reasonable price tag. Lastly, every system has one exotic ship. Let's just say you'll, <laughs> you'll know it when you see it. These are well-balanced ships that are fun to have and can be upgraded easily since they're always an S-Class. More on classes in a second. And I suppose I did leave one kind of ship out called the Living Ship, but we're not going to get to that in this particular episode. So yeah, technically there are six types of ships in No Man's Sky. Five we're kind of talking about today. And as a side note, don't forget to do the expeditions because, as we all learned in the first expedition, you can be rewarded with a time-limited ship in that case, it was the Golden Vector. Pretty cool. Every system has their own pool of ships, which mixes and matches various components and color schemes to make for a decent variety. If you use your analysis visor, you can see all the important information needed to decide if it's worth your hard-earned credits or not. You've got the ship name, which can be changed once you buy it. You have the ship type, and then you have its class, which can be C, B, a or S, with S being the top tier for Supreme. These serve as ceilings to a ship's max stats, so just know that your C-Class, even when maxed out, will always have a lower potential in its stats than the same ship in an S-Class. This includes its storage potential as well. But don't worry, if you spot a ship you really like and you see it's a C-Class, you can wait around to see if the same ship returns in a higher class. As we'll learn in the galaxy map portion of this video, a rich three-star economy system has a much greater chance of having A and S-class ships than a one-star economy. Don't worry, this will make sense in a second. After the class, you see a number, a plus sign, and another number. 
The first number tells you how much storage space the main inventory of the ship has, with the max being 48 slots. The second number tells you how large the technology section of the ship is, with 21 being the max. As a side note, the 48 and 21 are only possible with S-Class ships. The next line is the sticker price. As mentioned earlier, the more storage, the more expensive. The next few lines are where the current stats are for the ship in the areas of damage potential, shield strength, hyperdrive range, and maneuverability. Every non-abandoned system will have 20 different ships in their available pool that are somewhat unique to that system. All systems will have seven shuttles to choose from. After that, the way the systems divide their ship type is dependent on which race is the dominant one. It's easy to figure that out by checking out the NPC pilots or consulting the galaxy map, which we'll go over in a second. So the ship breakdown and systems goes like this. Gex will have seven haulers, three explorers, and three fighters. Corvax systems will have seven explorers, three haulers, and three fighters. And Viking will have seven fighters, three haulers, and three explorers. This plays a role later on when we have a few more units to spend on other ships. So speaking of units and spending, let's take a look at the various currencies in the game. If you go into your menu screen, you can see that we have a few different currencies. Units are used to purchase ships and supplies from trade terminals and NPC pilots. Nanites are used for upgrading everything in the game, such as modules, which provide a boost to your multi-tool, exosuit, exocraft, we'll cover that later, as well as your ship. These are available right here at the space station from various vendors. We'll head upstairs in a second for the full space station tour. Lastly, you can see that there's Quicksilver. This is a currency used to purchase unique appearance modifications and base parts, as well as a bunch of other items from a special vendor, which you unlock once you get to a certain point in the storyline. As you can see, the station is divided into two halves. As we face the back of the station, the left side is where you'll find all the vendors selling upgrades, each specializing in a certain area. Starting on the far right, here's a bit of a pilot lounge to check out, which usually has a few things you can pick up, as well as a trade terminal. The first stall on the right, next to the pilot lounge, is the multi-tool vendor. Like pretty much everything in the game, this can be upgraded with a variety of modules, or mods. Similar to ships, Mods are also divided into C, B, A, and S classes. Not only can you upgrade your multi-tool, you can actually purchase up to three and access them in your quick menu. I personally just use one, but if you see a cool one to purchase, you do have that option. Once again, you can see that multi-tools follow the class structure of C through S and offer a wide variety of upgrades to scanning, mining power, as well as add-on weapons like scatter blaster, pulse spitter, geology cannons, and plasma launchers and javelin. You know, I won't go into the details about each one. The fun is in the experimentation and using something you like. There's also an area to expand the number of slots in your multi-tool for units. As you do so, you'll notice the cost does go progressively upward, so keep that in mind. As another option, if you really like the one you have and you just want to upgrade its class, say it's an A class, and you want to upgrade to an S, that can be done, but to the tune of 10,000 nanites. Yeah, pretty steep price to pay. The next stall over is the Starship upgrades. Here you'll find a variety of upgrades you can install to boost your stats in hyperdrive range, pulse engine, as well as a variety of weapon upgrades. Next up is the Exocraft vendor, which we will eventually get to, but for this episode, we're going to go ahead and skip over this. The final stall is one I focus on in early game. This is upgrades for your exosuit, like hazard protection, life support, shields, as well as movement mods, which can make traveling around planets via jetpack so much easier. The most important part of this area is right here at the Exocraft expansion machine. Here you can purchase an extra slot for your exosuit for a reasonable price in the early game. Keep in mind these can only be purchased once per space station and get progressively more expensive. Trust me, if you haven't figured it out by now, you want as much storage as you can get. So make sure to visit this vendor whenever you hit a new system with a space station. There are three areas in your suit to expand. Your general area, your tech area, and your cargo area. 
I usually go for the cargo first, since each one can hold twice as much as a slot in the general. Moving over to the left, you can see an appearance modifier machine. This is where you can customize your character and finally change out of that grimy spacesuit. If you have a cool look you've put together but want to continue playing around, there's a spot to save up to three custom outfits. And just to the left of the appearance modifier is the Starship Outfitting Machine. Here you can add inventory slots to your ship with units. Or if you've come across storage augmentation, you can apply it here as well. Similar to the multi-tool, if you have 10,000 nanites, you can upgrade the class of your ship. When you get to having multiple ships, you get the option to scrap your current one. Once you do this, you get a variety of items that can then be sold at the trade terminal. You'll also get some mods and in many cases, storage augmentations. And the final stop for this side of the space station is the scrap dealer. You won't really have an immediate need to visit them, but you definitely need to know what their function is. As you can see, you'll have the option to purchase coordinates for 5 million units, which in the early game seems like an awful lot. Once you purchase this, you'll get a device called an emergency broadcast receiver, which is how you locate derelict freighters. These are abandoned freighters that you can explore and loot for resources, units, nanites, as well as their preferred currency, tainted metal. Tainted metal can be spent here at this vendor to obtain extra base decor, building parts, as well as other appearance modifiers. If you throw it in a refiner though, it converts to nanites on a 1 to 2 ratio, which is really nice. We'll definitely come back to this guy, but we're not quite ready yet. Alright, now on to the other side of the station. Moving in a similar fashion from right to left, you can see that there's a cartographer selling maps. These maps can be traded for nav data, which is conveniently scattered about the space station, as well as other areas you'll come across. The nav data can either come in glowing cubes or in more of a disk form, so make sure and look for both. You can see for 15 nanites you can get a random one, but I've, I've never done this. Doesn't make sense to me, because not only do I want to know which map I'm getting, nav data is plentiful and nanites are fairly scarce in the early game. Once you have a few nav data picked up, it's time to buy a map. You have a few options here depending on what you're hoping to gain. The first is secret cartographic data which gives you the location of a settlement that you need to break into. You'll solve a riddle and get rewarded with a few options. One of which is my go-to when I'm starting a fresh game and that's to unlock recipes. We'll get to that one in an upcoming episode. The next one down is emergency cartographic data. This points you to an abandoned settlement or a distress call from an NPC pilot that you can help to receive a random reward. Below that, you can exchange for a map pointing you in the direction of an inhabited outpost, such as a trading post, an observatory, or a minor settlement. Each one of these has a multi-tool cabinet inside, like the one here at the space station, containing a random multi-tool. So if multi-tool hunting is your thing, you'll want to stock up on these. And the last is alien cartographic data. This can point you towards a couple different objects which serve various purposes. Now, for the sake of this particular video, we're going to table this option. This will be very important in another Space Camp video, don't worry. Next up is the Guild Envoy. Their main objective is to issue rewards to travelers who have a minimum rank within a guild. To rank up in guilds, you must complete missions which are issued next door with the mission agent. As you move upward in rank with various guilds, your rewards increase in value. When you first come across these two, you won't be able to do anything until you reach a minimum standing with that race. This leads me to an important point. When you discover a new space station, make sure and talk to all the NPCs that are walking around. They'll teach you a word of their language, which you can then select practice language skills on the next NPC of the same race you encounter. This is a great way to increase your standing with that particular race. You can increase your standing in a variety of other ways, such as shooting pirates within a system, taking a research specimen you see, or bestowing a gift. Gex love Gek relics, Corvax love Corvax casings, and Viking love Viking effigies. All of these can usually be purchased off NPC pilots at trading posts. Now we'll get to trading posts in the next video. Once you gain some standing, you can then visit the mission agent and then browse missions to earn nanites as well as standing. Lastly, on the side of the station is another trade terminal, as well as a teleporter, which can take you anywhere you've made a base, as well as a prior station you've visited. Alright, so now that you have the lay of the land when it comes to the space station, it's time to get acquainted with the galaxy map. 
Once you're out of the space station, you can press down on the D-pad and select the swirly icon to pull up the galaxy map. There's a lot of information here, but we're just going to go over the basics for this video. If you do want a deeper dive into the map itself, make sure and check out my Galaxy Map Mastery video. The entire No Man's Sky universe is organized in 256 different galaxies. You start in Euclid, which is Galaxy 1. Now, within every galaxy, there are thousands of systems, and within every system there are planets, all procedurally generated and completely random when it comes to their environments, their appearances, terrain, fauna, and much more. And as you scan around the map, you'll notice four basic colors of stars. Yellow, which is what you start on, there's green, there's blue, and there's red. Now, everything that's not yellow needs a special drive to reach, such as emerald here for green. Red, you need cadmium, and if you're trying to reach a blue star, you're going to need indium. So when you move your cursor over a system, you'll see a lot of information here, including the name at the very top, and what the dominant race is of that particular system. So in this case, we've got a GEX system. Below that, you can actually see how rich or poor the economy is, going from one star to three stars. Just to the left of that pickaxe is a quick way to see which level of wealth the system has. And on the very bottom is a conflict meter, also ranging from one to three. Quick note, if you're just starting out, chances are you probably won't see the economy or the conflict, you can only see those with special scanners, which you unlock on the anomaly, which is part of the storyline. So don't worry, you'll unlock it very soon. We'll be coming back to the galaxy map once we're able to unlock a few drives, which we'll talk about in the next episode. So that, my friends, is going to do it. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you're still here, you're amazing. Thank you for all the support, guys. This is Taylor with Whiskey Barrel Gaming, signing off.